Hello and welcome to MLab 1231, Parasitology and Mycology. My name is Dustin Scott Brewster and this is going to be the first of our two-part presentation for the introduction of parasitology. Our objectives for this presentation are going to be to define parasitology in relevant terminology, discuss the terms associated with clinical parasitology, discuss the prevalence of parasites in the United States, list the risk factors associated with parasitic infection, describe the workflow and specimen processing for a parasitology lab, and describe the clinical tools used for the detection of parasites. Some of the terminology that we're gonna cover, not just throughout this presentation, but the entire course include parasite, of course, and that is when one animal derives its sustenance from another without making compensation. The uncompensated animal would act as the host. Host is when the partner providing resources to the parasite is not getting compensated. Some parasites require more than one host uh, to complete their life cycle, and this is known as an intermediate or definitive host. Parasitology itself is the science or study of the host-parasite relationship, and medical parasitology is the study of parasites which infect humans. The different types of hosts include the definitive host, and that is the host in which sexual maturity and reproduction of the parasite takes place. An intermediate host is when an essential stage of development occurs inside the host, but does not reach sexual maturity. A reservoir or carrier host is a host that harbors a parasite in nature and serves as a source of infection for other susceptible hosts. The reservoir host shows no sign or symptoms of disease from the parasite. A peritinic host is an accidental host that serves as a holding place for the parasite. A vector or carrier of a parasite from one host to another and often includes an insect or arthropod. Symbiosis means living together in a close association between two organisms. Mutualism is when both organisms benefit from the relationship and this, a good example, is an intestinal bacteria that resides in the human gut. Parasitism is when one organism is benefited at the expense of another, which is the host. For a reliable diagnosis of a parasitic infection, we need a few things. And that includes knowledge of the patient, which can include travel history, as certain parasitic infections are endemic to specific regions of the world, and so that would be important to know when diagnosing a patient. Other risk factors uh, include a daycare. Certain parasitic infections are more common when children who have no concept of germ theory are living or operating in a close environment, uh, as well as retirement homes or mental institutions it tend to be a uh, higher probability for a patient contracting a parasitic infection when one patient in that environment is infected. Also reliable for diagnosis is an appropriate specimen. Where is the specimen coming from? That usually includes a stool specimen, often could include a sputum specimen or a biopsy. Uh, depending on the type of infection suspected or the parasitic involved uh, would determine which type of specimen would be necessary. Uh, also important are the frequency of those collections and the time of those collections would be necessary for specific parasitic infections. Use of appropriate procedures. There's two concentration methods that are used, the flotation and the sedimentation method, depending on the parasite suspected, would determine which concentration method is most appropriate. Staining, if you want to look at intracellular structures like the cytoplasm or the nucleus of an organism. Wet mounts can be used for visualizing motility of specific parasites. Also important is adequate training of the technologist. This requires college courses such as this one, as well as workshops or continuing education as new procedures and new methods um, are developed. 
Why are infections so rare in the United States or North America? This is largely because of education, not just education of our population, but institutions such as the CDC, the World Health Organization, uh, perhaps the National Institute of Health, and the media does a good job of disseminating that information and letting people aware of potential outbreaks. We see cryptosporidium outbreaks occur every once in a while. Uh, cyclospora outbreaks occur every once in a while, and our uh, institutions do a good job of disseminating that information and finding the source. We also are in generally good health. We have uh, high nutritional standards, and we also happen to be very sanitary as uh, compared to a lot of places throughout the world. We also have a temperate climate, which means our, our climate is going to change, which is not going to be hospitable to certain intermediate vectors, uh, certain insects that may carry parasites aren't going to survive in our climate, uh, with the, which would also uh, include the absence of certain vectors like the Anopheles mosquito wouldn't survive in our climate. Risk factors uh, for infection, again, increased travel. Certain parts of the world are endemic to specific parasitic infections, so the more you travel, to these endemic regions, the more likely you are to become infected by a parasite. Low understanding about parasitic infection. Again, going back to certain institutions, uh, daycare centers, it's hard to teach germ theory to a baby. So without having that understanding uh, of how parasites are infected, um, could increase the probability of contracting a parasitic infection. For a parasite to be successful, a few things need to occur. It needs to be able to attach to its host and doesn't exhaust too many resources from that host. If it does exhaust too many resources and it does it too quickly, it's not going to be able to reproduce and pass on infection to other, other hosts, which would kill a parasite and kill the, the line of infection. So. The goal is to balance this. Of course, many people die from parasitic infections, but um, to exhaust enough resources to allow the parasite to disseminate into other hosts and be expelled and distributed uh, back into its life cycle. So maintain a balance is important for the parasite. What type of damage does the parasite cause the host? Well, it causes traumatic damage. Uh, it can cause tissue damage, intestinal damage, liver damage, or eye damage, depending on the parasite and its life cycle. It can also secrete enzymes, which would uh, cause enzymatic damage. The host could issue an immune response and this could cause localized inflammation to the site of infection, as well as, as well as eosinophilia, which is an elevated eosinophil count. It can cause blood loss from heavy hookworm infections. It can also cause secondary infections as the host's immune system is exhausted by the parasitic infection. The host could become susceptible to secondary infections, such as bacterial or viral infections. So how do we become infected by parasites if you are in those endemic regions with those parasites present? Well, there's filth-borne or contaminative infection, and this is due to a lack of personal hygiene or perhaps a lack of community sanitation. Maybe they don't have a septic system in place, uh, as we do in the United States, maybe something we often take for granted. Uh, but our ability to remove uh, our waste from our water sources. There could be soil or waterborne infection, and this is when water or dirt uh, contain eggs and can infect humans. Those larvae can also penetrate the skin of an infected soil source and water. There's also foodborne infections, depending again on specific parasites, um, beef, could be a source of parasitic infection. Undercooked beef, undercooked pork, fish, or shellfish could all be a source of potential parasitic infection. There's also arthropod-borne infections. The, the bite of specific mosquitoes, um, namely the Anopheles mosquito, 
uh, transmits malaria or the plasmodium genus. Reduvian bugs, uh, sandflies as well as tsetse flies can all be modes of arthropod, arthropod borne infections. What are some of the instruments that we're going to use in a clinical laboratory to detect a parasitic infection? Well, you need a good microscope. And a good microscope is going to include calibrated objectives, which allow you to measure the size of what you're looking at. You can see on the right image here, we have a roundworm um, next to this ocular scale. That ocular scale is going to allow you to determine the relative size of that organism. And these are usually conducted on a compound light microscope. A centrifuge that's often used is a swing bucket centrifuge. This also needs to be calibrated so it's spun at the correct relative centrifugal force, or RCF, also uh, abbreviated G sometimes, or it could be measured in revolutions per minute, which is RPMs. So how are specimens collected for processing and examination? So the types of specimens that you would get in a clinical parasitology lab include natural secretions such as feces, sputum, or urine. Again, depending on the type of parasite is going to determine what would be the appropriate specimen type. Other parasites infect the blood such as malaria, the plasmodium species, the plasmodium genus. Uh, tissue biopsies can be collected uh, for other parasitic infections as well as needle aspirates. So the collection and processing of intestinal dwelling parasites often includes a fecal specimen. So the patient needs to be properly prepared for the collection of a fecal specimen. And this includes avoiding stool interfering substances uh, such as anti-diarrheal medication or laxatives. You also want the patient to not be on any, on any antimicrobial medications 10 days prior to collection. Um, you also want the specimen, the stool specimen, to be free of contamination, which can include urine, water, or dirt, uh, as these contaminants could lead to a false diagnosis if you have a parasite present that's only present in urine and it's present in feces, that could lead to a false diagnosis. So it needs to be a specimen free of urine, water, or dirt. That's going to conclude the first part of our intro to parasitology. We will pick this back up with part two.